You can turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're taking a little break from the book of Romans while Smed was away and um, doing a a two-parter from Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 31. And last week we looked at Hebrews 10, uh, 19 through 25. We're going to be back in the book of Hebrews this morning, and God's timing is always perfect. His care for us is profound. It was timely, I believe, last week to be reminded in such a succinct fashion from Hebrews 10, particularly verses 19 through 21, of the superior work of Jesus. This is a truth that we love, that Jesus was the perfect and the only acceptable sacrifice who has made a way for us to have confidence to enter into the very holy place of God by his own blood. Uh, That his flesh, flesh has inaugurated a new way for us that allows us to no longer be under condemnation, no longer bound by a guilty conscience as we have been sprinkled clean, our conscience has. We can draw near now to God with a sincere heart. These are truths that we love. An eternally acceptable sacrifice that allows us to no longer be under condemnation. We can draw near with a sincere heart, with a clean conscience, with full assurance. And what a precious certainty in a time of uncertainty to know these things. And what Christ has done for each one of us who is his must be an anchor for our souls. And then we saw the appropriate response to this reality of who Jesus is, the priestly ministry of Jesus. What's the appropriate response? And it came in the way of commands, imperatives, that is to draw near to God, trusting in the work of Christ. It is to hold fast the confession of our hope and then to consider, to give intentional thought on how to stimulate or provoke one another. And to what? To, to love and to good deeds. And the way that we do that is by not forsaking our own assembling together. We need to be connected to one another. We need to be joined with one another. And all these commands have been particularly helpful to embrace this week, but I've been especially encouraged by the last one that we're called to give careful consideration of each other. Careful consideration of each other, how to stimulate one another. That's the command there. And to do this for the purpose of stimulating each other towards love and towards good deeds, that which is right before God. And so the command is consider how to stimulate. The command isn't don't cancel a service, don't change your normal routines, but rather to consider how to stimulate in the unique circumstances that we find ourselves in currently with COVID-19 gives us great opportunity to thoughtfully and intentionally consider each other and how to stimulate one another towards love and good deeds. And that's crucial for us to contemplate this, to embrace this command. Some find the situation scary and are working through sinful fear and anxiety. Some are filled with anger and disbelief at those around them. Some are filled with apathy. Some think everyone's overreacting. Some think everyone is underreacting. And our greatest responsibility in all of this is not to control those around us but to love each other well in the midst of this. And there's a great temptation to give more consideration to our own thinking and our own preferences, even our own ideas of how the right way to respond is, rather than give consideration how to love and serve those around us. That must be what we pursue. That must be how we direct our heart. With patience, we press forward, trusting God. He's addressed our greatest problem through the blood of his son. How much more can we trust him right now? We can trust him. And then we come to our passage this morning. As I've considered this passage this week, what has been far more terrifying than anything happening happening around us is the potential of what the author of Hebrews speaks to in our text being true of any one of us. This passage is maybe one of the most sobering in all of scripture. 
Let's read together this morning. We'll start in verse 19 so that we can see our section in context, and we'll work through verse 31. So Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, because of these things, right, last week, then the commands let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, the second command, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And then verse 24, the third command, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And then our passage this morning, verse 26 for if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. It is a protection for us from our own thoughts and ideas pray that we would humble ourselves under your word, that we would submit ourselves to your word and what you have revealed. We know that there is nothing more helpful at any time than taking our minds off of ourselves and setting our minds on you. And we want to do that this morning. We want to draw near to you in your word that we would see what we must. And where we need to be affirmed and encouraged Lord, I pray that that would take place in our hearts and where we need to be admonished and sobered and where we need to repent. I pray that we would do so in humility. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. This is the fourth warning passage in the book of Hebrews if we were making our way through the entire book, and this one may be the most frightening. Verses 19 through 21 as we said last week, are really a summary of the entire book thus far, which is pointing to the superior work of Jesus, the superior work of Jesus, his priestly ministry, and that we must embrace him. We must embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus. That is the thrust of this whole section, to embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, to look to him as the only means of salvation before a holy God. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can add. There's nothing that we can accomplish that would merit forgiveness of sins before a holy God. We have sinned. We have offended. And Jesus has made a way where there was no way. We must embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus. That's been the thrust of these 10 chapters of Hebrews. This morning, there are some things that we must understand, however, about what's at stake, what happens if we reject Jesus, if we don't embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, if we either outwardly disregard him or through action, reject him. There's some things that we must understand about what's at stake, what happens if we don't embrace Jesus. Are any of you afraid of heights? If you are, and you're at a, at a high level, the phrase that you probably most often hear is, don't look down, right? Right? 
These first 10 chapters, primarily with the exclusion of some short sections, the author of Hebrews has been calling us to look up to Christ. Look at what he's done. Look at the way that he has made. Look at all that he has accomplished. Well, this morning, for a moment, he's actually directing us to look down at what awaits us should we reject Jesus. For those who are afraid of heights, Typically, they have a distorted view of what awaits them if they look down, an exaggerated view of what awaits them if they look down. In our case, there is no way to exaggerate the terrifying end for those who reject Jesus as their Lord. We're going to look down for a moment and see what awaits us if we look to anything but Jesus and truly trust anything other than him. And it is terrifying. Verse 26 begins with the word for, or it could be read because, and this is on the heels of the imperatives that the author just gave. Why are the imperatives from last week so important? Why is embracing Jesus as your high priest so important? The obligation of your obedience and submission to draw near, to live in the hope and to consider each other and to intentionally consider each other in the, in the local assembly are increasingly urgent. Why? Because we're increasingly near to the day when Jesus returns. Remember, we touched on that briefly last week in verse 25. All the more do these things as the day draws near. Jesus is coming soon, so don't delay. This is the reason last week's outflow of the right embracing of Jesus is so important, right? If you truly embrace Jesus, these are the commands that you must cling to that follow one who has experienced the saving grace of Jesus. So we're going to see why. And what we find, the reason is, it is because a rejection of him leads to a terrifying end. If you hear these things about Christ, you know these things about Christ intellectually, but yet you refuse to live in the way that actually demonstrates an embracing of them, that leads to a terrifying end. The author really lays out a number of consequences to the one who rejects Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to see and continue to see the call to embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus. But there's some things we must understand that are at stake here. We must embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him does several things. And we see the first in verse 26. So embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him, number one, rejects the only sacrifice for sins. You could say the only acceptable sacrifice for sins. To to not embrace Jesus rejects the only sacrifice for sins. We see that in verse 26. Look again, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If you come to a knowledge of the once for all sacrifice of Jesus, that's what the author of Hebrews has set forth and explained Jesus' sacrifice is and was. And if you go on sinning willfully after knowing the truth, there isn't any other sacrifice left. Jesus is the only way. And to reject that is to reject the only means of grace. And if you reject the commands of that one, it is equivalent to rejecting him. You can't say, I accept Jesus, but I reject his commands. That's important to understand what the word willfully means here. This is crucially important to understand what the word means. If you have the ESV, it reads deliberately. The reality is every act of sin, every sin is an act of the will. Every sin is a moment of lack of belief or lack of submission to God. And we are culpable for those sins, every single one. Yet sinning willfully is different than that. This is a state of being willful. This is, this is without compulsion. You're not forced into it anyway. It's not a momentary lapse of judgment. This is an intentional, voluntary act of willful disobedience before the Lord. 
This is a, I know the right thing to do, and I defiantly and continually reject it. This isn't the internal struggle of a man or woman in the mixed condition who temporarily struggles with a sin and is broken over that sin and is repentant of that sin. This is one who knows the right way to live, knows the commands of God, knows the instruction of God, knows the way they are to live in light of the grace of God, and yet presses on in disobedience. And even worse, uses the reality of the gospel to excuse it. This is planned, premeditated, and a commitment to a path of defiance before the Lord. And here it is clear from the context that sinning willfully has to do with rejecting the commands that go with following Christ as your high priest. Willful, willing is not a a willing sin in the moment, but a conscious expression of an, an attitude that displays contempt for God. This isn't a moment of disbelief, but a deliberate, continual rejection of submission. And in context, this is specifically, I refuse to draw near to God. I want forgiveness of sins, but I compromise and I don't hold fast the confession of my hope. I know that I should cling to the truths about Jesus, but for the sake of something else, I will compromise. And I'm okay with that. This is, I want a relationship with God, but I reject his people with whom I'm commanded to consider and to stimulate and to love. That's the context of what's going on in our passage. Pursue those three exhortations with increasing diligence, because if you go on sinning willfully, there is not a sacrifice for sins. This is the one who deliberately and willfully disregards the instructions in the previous passage. And what we find here is the most clear and immediate indicator of whether you have embraced Jesus truly is how you actually respond to his commands. How do you respond to the instruction of God that you claim to submit to and love? John 3, 36 is helpful. It reads, he who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If we use the truth of the gospel to get around obedience, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. There's nothing, there's nothing more terrifying than knowledge of the truth followed by willful disobedience. There's not a scarier place to be than a willful, voluntary sinner in the church. After having a knowledge of the truth, are you in a committed pattern of excusing your sin? After knowing the truth of the gospel, do you explain away your sin, justify your sin, ignore your sin, Cling on to your sin with a disregard for Scripture. We're to embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him rejects the only sacrifice for sins. And next, number two, embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him merits only an expectation of judgment. It merits only an expectation of judgment. Look at verse 27 but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. There's no sacrifice for sin that remains. All that does remain for this one is a terrifying expectation of judgment. This judgment is terrifying and really there isn't anything more terrifying than this. Nothing remains. There's nothing left to make you right with God. And all you should expect is the righteous fury of God's wrath. And here we see the word terrifying in verse 27. And we saw it also in verse 31, really as bookends of what one who is rejecting Christ, walking in willful disobedience should expect. 
And Smed did a wonderful job teaching on the reality of hell and the judgment that awaits those who do not know Christ in a saving way. And if you have not listened to those sermons from Romans, you need to. You need to go back and listen to those sermons. I'm not gonna dive into all of that again this morning. If you haven't heard it, you need to go listen to those, but we are gonna continue working through what is said here. The author quotes Isaiah 26, 11 in verse 27 of Hebrews, and this quote is in the context where God's wrath is coming against people who were associated with the people of God. They were exposed to God's law and instruction. They heard his precepts but did not embrace them. And God's judgment is coming against people who have heard the truth and are aware of the truth and reject the truth. And there is a terrifying expectation of judgment coming towards those who have been with God's people, worshiping with those people, dwelling among those people, but who do not practice the instruction from God and in essence have rejected Christ. That's the point the author of Hebrews is making here. And it's important to remember, this isn't about how someone gets saved. I wanna make that very clear. This is not about how someone gets saved. It's not. It's not about how someone gets saved. That is the work of Christ put forth in the first 10 chapters of Hebrews The only way of salvation is grace alone through faith. Hebrews points out the reality that it is only by grace alone through faith that God grants salvation in his son and it is his son's work alone that can save someone. This obedience is not about you being good enough for God that he might display favor to you. This is about the reality that those whom God saves by his grace Those who are rescued by his grace inevitably walk in love and submission to him. And if you reject the new life that Christ freely offers, you are rejecting Christ. This passage reveals how God is zealous for his people. You talk about enemies of God, pagans are enemies, but there's a whole different degree that we see here when you are part of the people of God, associating with the people of God and choose to reject Christ and the new life that Christ freely offers. It is a horrible offense. One pastor said it this way in relation to this verse. The question is not, do they know about the practice of righteousness, but do they practice righteousness? It's not enough to simply know the truths of what God calls us to. If you're a believer in the Lord, you have been rescued from your sin, you have the spirit of God dwelling inside of you, then you are to live in light of that, in obedience. You're no longer bound by sin, enslaved to it. So we embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him rejects the only sacrifice for sin. It it merits only an expectation of judgment. And then next in verses 28 and 29, we must embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him demands a more severe punishment. It demands a more severe punishment. Not only is there a certain expectation of a terrifying judgment, but now the author is going to demonstrate that it demands a more severe judgment. Look at verses 28 and 29. He gives an example. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? Do you feel the wind being let out of the sails? This is sobering. In Deuteronomy 17, if someone living among God's people who knew God's instruction was found worshiping another God on the basis of two or three witnesses, that one was put to death. Corporal punishment, 
This, this one, this person, on the basis of two or three witnesses in Israel, is continuing to sin and disregard God's word. This one would die, be stoned without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Verse 29 of our passage. How much more severe a punishment is deserved for one who trampled underfoot the Son of God. The comparison is sinning against God's instruction to not worship other gods in the Old Testament versus now how much more a greater degree of culpability, a greater degree of punishment for someone who sins willfully against the gospel, against the Son of God. And then three descriptions of what is happening when you reject Jesus willfully sinning against him. Look at verse 29. He has trampled underfoot the Son of God. He has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. And he has insulted the spirit of grace. First, trampled underfoot the Son of God. This is where you despised or thought lightly of. You walked right over Jesus himself, the son of God, the one who became flesh to die for sinful man. And your action of willful disobedience, when you know the truth is a trampling of him under your feet, this is unconscionable pride and arrogance. Next has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant, by which he was sanctified, he's considered, he's regarded the blood of the covenant common. Jesus' blood poured out. The Son of God, the perfect Holy One who suffered in place of those whom he would redeem regarding his blood. The perfect Holy Sacrifice it's common. Unclean. Regarding Jesus' blood, his death, as just like every other death. What an atrocity. A perspective that what happened on the cross was just another death. Nothing different about him. And has insulted the spirit of grace. You've, mo you've mocked the spirit insulted him. You have treated him with hostility. This one coming to a knowledge of the spirit's ministry and yet rejecting the spirit's influence to bring holiness into your life. That is an insult. It's mocking him. And again, this is a willful, intentional, continual, unrepentant, continuing in sin. This demands a more severe punishment. There's a greater culpability that exists. Next, number four, embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus, knowing that a rejection of him will bring about an imminent judgment. An imminent judgment. A certain judgment. Look at verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. The author is quoting Deuteronomy 32. And when God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We know it is imminent. It is coming. It is certain. The author quotes Deuteronomy 32, which is just perfect for what is going on here. It is a song of praise. And you see Moses is worshiping God. He's worshiping Yahweh. And in song, in, in this quote, he's expressing concern about the nature of unbelief among the people who are not believing the promises of God. To be among the people of God, to know the decrees of God and not submit yourself to him is terrifying. It's a terrifying place to remain. He will judge. It is imminent. There's no escape from his judgment. And the person who is among his people and willfully refusing to follow him, who, who is claiming allegiance to him, but rejecting him is his number one enemy. You can trick everyone in the church, but you can't trick God. 
He sees, he knows. You can hide your willful sin from one another, but you cannot hide it from God. And the conscience God sprinkles clean for those who are his, you do not have that conscience. You are condemned and God will repay and it will be severe and it is imminent. There's no escape. This passage really displays the two realities that are extremes and there's nothing in the middle. For those who have heard the truth about God, we must embrace Christ. You see, to be under God's grace, to be his child, is the most comforting reality the most eternally altering reality for any individual. Hope, comfort, joy, peace are all found for those who are in Christ, for those who have embraced Christ. And yet to willfully reject him indeed in continual defiant sin is the most terrifying thing and your judgment should you remain in that is imminent. Vengeance is the Lord's. He will repay. He will judge his people. For those who have truly embraced Jesus, they have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. That's the case the author of Hebrews has been setting forth time and again. Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for those who are truly in him. There's no fear. There's no condemnation. Your conscience has been cleansed. It's been sprinkled clean. You have received a righteousness that is not your own. You have a priest, a high priest who intercedes continually. One true sacrifice. You don't have to think or figure out where that next sacrifice is going to come with, to come from to keep you right with God. Jesus has done it all. That's what awaits those who have truly embraced Jesus. But for those who have merely feigned allegiance to Jesus, there is a terrifying end, an imminent judgment. Vengeance is the Lord. He will repay. Lastly, really a summary statement of these verses. We must embrace the priestly ministry of Jesus knowing that a rejection of him leads to a terrifying end. A terrifying end, number five. Look at verse 31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Terrifying thing. For someone to know the instruction of God and voluntarily, willfully reject it is the most terrifying thing. There isn't anything else. If they've rejected Christ, there is nothing else to turn them toward to find hope in. For this type of sinner to fall into the hands of the living God is absolutely and utterly terrifying. We overreact to many things. There is no overreaction to this thought. It should be crippling for those whom it applies to. To fall into the hands is a common term we see in scripture. Falling into the hands of someone is to be their enemy. Under their control, you are their captive. You are under their rule. You have no rights. And to have this happen for you as you fall into the hand of the living God is absolutely and utterly terrifying. And yet at this moment, the end is not sealed for each one in this room, for each one who is hearing this reality. The end is not, is not sealed. You still have time to repent, but to fall into the hands of the living God. At that time, when you face judgment, at that time, when you give an account, at that time, when there is a reckoning, you will have nothing to say no defense, 
only condemnation, only guilt, only culpability, and you will receive only judgment, and it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it's terrifying, not because he is an unjust, tyrannical ruler, but it's terrifying because he's a righteous one. And we are completely and utterly guilty before him for our sin. And how much more if we have the truth set right before us, teed up, the door is wide open, and we slam it shut, and we knowingly, specifically reject it. Beloved, how... How should this impact how we think about sin in this church? How about how, how about how we think about others' care for us in our sin? What is more terrifying to you, being falsely accused or questioned or having somebody ask you some questions or... or or have some thoughts that they want you to consider, is, is that more scary? Or is the reality that you might be deceived and in unrepentant sin more scary? That, that you might be walking in continual disregard for the instructions of the instructions of Christ. And to, to embrace this reality, to know this reality is true, to live in light of this reality does not compete with the grace of God. It just doesn't. To love each other well, to encourage one another, to give specific intentional consideration of how to help each other love and how to help each other walk in obedience does not compete with the grace of God. It is a proper response to the grace of God. This is what the grace of God should produce within us when we have been freely forgiven of all of our sins before God, when we have been reconciled to him, when we have been declared righteous on the works and merit of Christ alone. This is how we must respond. Humble, joyful, eager, intentional obedience to Christ out of love. We need to be sober-minded in our response to this. Some need to hear this and should be utterly terrified. Some need to hear this and, and need to be comforted. It's a good opportunity to not be left with your own thoughts about this. Interact with one another, love each other, draw each other out in regards to this truth. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord, walking in obedience. It's far better to walk in obedience under God's grace, infinitely better than suffering eternally under God's wrath. Okay, we looked down. Now let's remember all of the wonderful truths about Christ for those who are really in him. If in hearing this, you have found yourself convicted, if you found yourself pinned by this passage, secret sin, you know about it, you love it, you've been unwilling to let go of it, you disregard God's truth, you come to church to appease your own conscience, you've never given thought as to how to love others, as to how to consider others within the body of Christ. You have not actually drawn near to God. You compromise the confession of your hope. You don't have a regard for the truth of scripture. Your participation in this body has merely been an outward expression of accommodation, but not inward change. If that's you, repent. Repent now. Flee from the terrifying expectation of judgment that awaits you should you not. Repent, turn to Christ, confess, find an elder, talk to us, let us help you, let us serve you, let us love you. 
If that's not you, praise God, it is only by his grace. Whatever obedience you're walking in isn't because you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and got your act together. It's because you're merely walking in the power of his grace, which he has supplied for you and all glory is due to him and find joy and comfort in all of those things that this terrifying expectation of judgment that awaits those who reject Christ does not await you. You can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence and hope and comfort because of the blood of Jesus where all of our hope is found. Our only hope is found. Draw near to Christ. Embrace Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the perfect sacrifice of your son, that those of us who have embraced Christ as Lord, who have embraced the priestly ministry of Jesus, there is no longer fear for us of what awaits us. There is a reverential fear and love of you, but not one that is fearful of condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Help us to remember these things. Help us to embrace these things. Help us to love these things. And let our right understanding of who you are and what you have done catapult us into a life of obedience and submission and love for you and love for others. Lord, we thank you for grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for your righteousness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.